walking virtually along the world's most revered footpaths and connecting the global community of pilgrims. It's the Sacred Steps Podcast, available on YouTube and your favorite podcast app. Broadcasting from the Shamer Studios in Florida, here's your host, pilgrim, backpacker, and author, Kevin Donahue. Buen Camino, pilgrims, and welcome back to the Sacred Steps Podcast. I'm Kevin Donahue, pilgrim, backpacker, and author of Sacred Steps, a pilgrimage journal. On today's episode, I am so glad to welcome back my friend from London, England, Andy Bull. Andy joined us during season one to talk about the legacy of pilgrimage in the UK, the interruption that took place with the English Reformation, and the rebirth of the pilgrimage movement. His book, Pilgrim Pathways from Trailblazer, outlines 20 short walks across England, Scotland, and Wales, and actually helped form the basis of three of my walks in the UK this past year, the Pilgrim's Way from London to Canterbury, the English leg of the Via Francigena from Canterbury to Dover, and the Pilgrim Path to the Holy Island of Lindisfarne. So today, Andy and I are going to be discussing four great walks in the UK that you can take as a one to two day route or a longer walk if you're so inclined. Before we begin with Andy, I want to thank so many of you for visiting our new website at sacredstepspodcast.com and sending a voicemail about your upcoming pilgrimage plans. Many of you are planning a Camino de Santiago, and a few of you are even looking to walk in the UK. If you haven't sent your voicemail yet, it's really easy. Simply visit sacredstepspodcast.com, click send voicemail, and tell us who you are, where you're from, and your next steps. The website has our new membership program as well, allowing you to join at any of three different levels for private member live streams and even some one-on-one sessions where I will be helping you plan your upcoming pilgrimage. Speaking of planning, if you're planning your first Camino and you're looking for answers and resources, check out our Sacred Steps channel on YouTube. We have a video series there called Camino 101 with simple five-minute video answers to basic questions about your first Camino. Everything from which route should I take? uh, How much should I budget? How can I prevent blisters? Which apps to use? There are some great video resources at our Sacred Steps channel on YouTube. Now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to welcome my friend, Andy Bull, author of Pilgrim Pathways, back to the podcast. Today, we're discussing four short walks in the UK, including a route that I recently completed to Holy Island and a very exciting walk to Stonehenge. So if you're interested in walking in the UK, please join me in welcoming back Andy Bull. Andy Bull, welcome back to the Sacred Steps podcast. Hi, Kevin. Great to be speaking to you again. I, I'm so glad to see you, my friend. It's been a few months since we were together in London. Um, I just want to thank you one more time. You gave me such a great Beckett Pilgrim token when we were together um, at Southwark and walking across uh, the bridge. Yeah, Kevin, I've got to say, I'm very impressed with uh, your pronunciation of Southwark because that's not an easy one. That's one we like to trip people up with. So well done. You've got it. Do you remember when we had our first podcast together uh, back in, I think it was 2020, and I said Southwark Cathedral? Do you remember that one? Yeah. Yeah. And And I told you, I told you that's where JR lived. (laughs) And look at me now. Yeah. You're a Brit. (laughs) Well, I wouldn't go that far, but I've certainly learned a lot about UK pilgrimage. And a lot of that has been from your book, Pilgrim Pathways, talking to you, jumping on some of the Facebook groups that are dedicated to British pilgrimage, learning from the British Pilgrimage Trust, talking to pilgrims who've walked like Joe Francis Penn, and then looking forward to the walks that I completed in 2021, um, the Pilgrim's Way from London to Canterbury, the English leg of the Via Francigena from Canterbury to Dover, and then the Pilgrim Path to Holy Island. 
And I thought we'd get together, talk about a few walks from your book, Pilgrim Pathways, maybe starting with that Northern Saints walk that I kind of finished recently, ending at Holy Island at Lindisfarne. Looking at the book, Andy, there's a lot in that Northern Saints walk. Absolutely. I mean, you you know, normally when well, I've, I've tried to build the walks around each one around a particular saint, but um, you get three for one here. You've got the three northern saints. Um, you've got Aidan, who um, was brought from the island of Iona to Christianize the um, uh, Oswald's um, kingdom of Northumberland, and he put him on on Lindisfarne, Holy Island. He was the abbot there. Um, then you've got um, Oswald himself, kind of warrior king, who who, who became converted and one of his people converted. And then you've got Cuthbert, who was kind of, because he was so impressed with um, Aidan and his story, became a monk and ultimately himself also became the abbot of um, Lindisfarne. So yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating, fascinating bit of history. That's a really interesting sort of relationship that happened too. So, um, and because I happened to be in Holy Island last year, I learned a little bit about Aiden and Cuthbert and their relationship. And Oswald originally had another monk from Iona come before Aiden, and it really didn't work out. Um, he was trying to uh, spread Christianity. The, the monk went back to Iona, very frustrated, and the way it was told to me, sort of, you know, I don't know, 35th hand, um, was frustrated because in Northumbria the the people just weren't learning Christianity the way the way the monk was trying to teach it and and he was speaking to Aiden and and Aiden said well how did you try to teach them um, you know and they were trying to learn Latin and and no one in Northumbria knew Latin let alone read or write Latin um, and Aiden said well I think I could I think I could do this and so. He was, was, there was outreach to Oswald and Aiden came to Northumbria and he was a man of the people. He was known for walking throughout Northumbria, speaking to um, the English in, in their native tongues and, and learning a lot and became sort of a evangelical ambassador for Oswald. Yeah, I mean it's it, it's it's fascinating, and that kind of approach is is very interesting. I mean, I think it's it's obviously it's relevant to any any um, evangelist. Uh, you've got to be able to speak to people in a way that they understand, and uh, you know, treat them as um, uh, people of, of intelligence um, who um, you know are are seeking like we all are. So that I didn't know that actually. That's that's very interesting, Kevin. That's well, interesting. I walked I walked around with a fake monk. Um, and, and if you're listening, Chris, great to great to uh, connect with you. I'll send you a message on Facebook thanking you for telling me a bit about the story. But Oswald gave Lindisfarne, the island of Lindisfarne, uh, Holy Island, to Aden to to found his see, and that's where the Lindisfarne Priory was was built. And this became a place of holy pilgrimage as Aden and Cuthbert built. Um, really Christianity in Northumbria. Well, that, that's right. And um, it's it's something that, you know, people are very conscious of in that area. And you've got some very, couple of very well-established long pilgrim paths, St. Oswald's Way, which goes down from Scotland, and St. Cuthbert's Way, which runs through Northumberland. Um, and the thing about, what, when I looked at those routes, and I was planning my book, the idea I had with, with this particular book, Pilgrim Pathways, was to try and give people a kind of an introduction to pilgrimage. People who were quite keen walkers, but looked at the length of a lot of pilgrim paths, well over 100 miles, and thought, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that I can do that. Right. So my idea was to kind of get, to, to look, it's almost like pilgrimage, you know, greatest hits. It's the things you can do in a weekend. And I tried to make it really easy. So there's the places to stay, there's the how to get your you know, uh, public transport, ideally in and out, if not taxis, um, where to stay for the night, you know, where to get, you know, provisions, um, all the kind of tips that hopefully would make it as easy as possible. And I, I mean, I, I thought it was a fascinating area. One thing I particularly liked about Cuthbert was, um, as we were saying, Cuthbert, he did become abbot of Lindisfarne, but he, he kind of got tired of it and he decided to become a hermit again. And he went to um, the Farne Islands, uh, which are 
uh, it's now a nature reserve run by the National Trust off the Northumberland coast at sea houses. So I start my pilgrimage, get on a boat. I know it's not walking. You get on a boat out to um, uh, the Inner Farn, and you do find there are amazing buildings that survive from that period. And from there, there's a lovely walk. So the next place up the coast is um, uh, is where um, Oswald had his um, his um, one of his castles at Bamba. And then next to it is the church he dedicated to, to St. Aidan and where Aidan is buried. So within this very short period, it's my pilgrimage, I think, is like 27 something miles. You get a wonderful experience of these three amazing characters and also, of course, some wonderful, wonderful landscape. Yeah. So this area is actually really breathtakingly beautiful. And I wasn't familiar with Northumbria. So when I took my my walk to Holy Island, which which follows Pilgrim Pathways um, across the causeway, I was really impressed because from Bamber you can see Lindisfarne, you see all of this area, and and it's just rustic, and you get such a different feel um, of the of the English coast there. Um, you mentioned that you go from Bamber where there is a proper castle right? Um, Oswald's castle. And then the church for St. Aidan. Um, I had read at one point that there was a huge fire that was going to take this church. And through prayer, um, Aidan, it said, uh, change the winds and save the church. And it, it's just, it's such a sacred site um, to start the pilgrimage there. Absolutely. And, you know, you mentioned landscape. I don't know about you, but that experience of walking, you've got to do it at low tide and we probably need to stress, you've got to check those tide tables because it's, what is it, a mile? It's probably more than a mile across the sands, across the causeway from the mainland to the island. But you get out there and, um, I mean, it's eerie, isn't it? You know, it's the only sound is the wind and there's the birds in the air and um, you look well, back. And, there's one more. There's one oh, more. Okay. There's the the... The sea lions, the the seals, or, or whatever they are, they're barking off in the distance. So, I took this walk at, um, as you said, a low tide. Low tide was like seven o five in the morning, and so I had a couple miles before I got to the causeway. And then you walk, as you said, uh, across the receding North Sea, the sands, and there are poles that map that mark the pilgrim pathway across the the island and you've done this walk too you've you've walked the causeway over to Lindisfarne and then when you arrive it it's such a it's really a special arrival and I, and I talked about it in one of my podcasts um, and so people can listen to it in more detail but such a great sense of place to arrive to Lindisfarne and be at the Priory um, and, and see Cuthbert's Island and really so much of of where English Christianity took hold throughout Northumbria and really all throughout England. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And there is that amazing sculpture in the church of monks carrying the coffin, uh, carrying um, Cuthbert's coffin, because as you probably know, um, a couple of centuries after his death, and I think it was in the ninth century, there were threats from um, Viking raiders. So they they upped sticks and left and left the island, and they took Cuthbert's remains with them, um, and travelled around the north for you know some time before eventually ending up in Durham, and they placed the remains in a church, which is now Durham Cathedral. So you've got a whole another aspect of things going on there. So I didn't get the chance to visit Durham Cathedral and actually see the um, the shrine of Saint Cuthbert there, but but that actually takes place in another walk that you've had um, going to Durham Cathedral, and and maybe we can get into that at another point. Um, but this walk goes up through. You also go through the. Help me with my my American the Ky- tongue. You, the Kylo Hills. Kylo Hills. Yeah, you got. I, in fact, I think that's how they say it. They may they may tell me other otherwise, <laughs> but yeah, the Kylo Hills. So that's very interesting. So um, after Bamber, you go inland. Um, and it's quite rising country, um, you know, wild, um, remote um, moorland. And then there's a place, there's a wood. And if you go into this wood, you trail around and you find beneath the trees, completely, you know, hidden, an enormous cave, which is called Cuthbert's Cave. And there's, 
we're not quite sure what the connection with Cuthbert is. It may be that when he was in his kind of his hermit period, he he, he had a hermitage there. It could it could be that um, the monks, where well, they were carrying his remains eventually to Durham, rested there. We're not really sure, but it's a very very big cave. Goes right in under the under the ground, and you can see for centuries people have gone there and carved their names. And uh, it's a curious curious place, really unexpected. And, and this is part of for those who are doing the. The full route of the St. Cuthbert's Way, they would start in Melrose Abbey uh, in the Scottish border regions and then walk all the way along St. Cuthbert's, go through this um, this uh, cave at, at what we're calling Kylo, uh, Kylo Hills, and then on to Holy Island. It's really a, a special pilgrimage. That one is about 62 miles, but this Northern Saints Walk in Pilgrim Pathways is is just over 25 miles. It's it's very doable in just a day or two. Yeah, absolutely. That was the plan. And also, it does give you time, if you want to, to start off by going on the boat trip out to the Farm Islands, which I think makes, well, for me, that's a unique pilgrimage. I haven't been able to do that on any, any other trip. That's fantastic. I, I've got to get back to do the boat trip because I, I haven't done that. So I'm going to put that on my bucket list uh, for, for my UK pilgrimage. Also on my bucket list, everyone was asking me because, you know, I did, I did a couple of routes that were connected, um, London to Canterbury, Canterbury to Dover. And so that was very easy through the, the Kentish countryside over in the, the, I, I don't know if you call it the southeastern part of it. Southeast, of, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, Southeast, that's what I'm yeah. calling it, the southeastern part of yeah, England. Yeah, yeah. And and some of my, my acquaintances, you know, the geography of England is a little fuzzy sometimes for Americans. They said, oh, did you visit Stonehenge? And I said, no, because that's, that's actually the opposite direction. So uh, I know I've got to visit Stonehenge. I was looking at Pilgrim Pathways, and walk number four in Pilgrim Pathways actually concludes at Stonehenge. Can you take us through that? Absolutely. Yeah, you're, you're right. That's, we'd say that was kind of central southern England. Um, it's up on, on the moors. But th- this, I, I was very interested in Stonehenge, um, A, because it's, uh, well, a very curious and amazing, unique place. But also, um, about you know, a couple of days' walk from it is another um, equally ancient, about 5,000 years old place called the Avebury Stone Circle to the north of it. Um, and what interested me was, you know, there are various theories. We don't really know. We, we know that there were some kind of ritual connections with these two. But there is one theory that um, the Avebury Stone Circle was a kind of a celebration of life um, and that Stonehenge is more about death. It's about, um, uh, about honouring ancestors or the recently dead. And there is one theory that... Um, Pilgrims, and we're talking. This is what you know, three thousand years before Christianity, which which makes me think cr- pilgrimage is something which is so innate. It's not. It's 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 a it's about belief, but it's not just about Christian belief. And, I, and I, right. that that's what got me going on this one. But there is one theory that um, when you do that route from Avebury to Stonehenge, you go you can go along for a lot of it along um, a river valley. The 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 Avon Valley of the River Avon, which is again a lovely, lovely walk. And if you do that, you come into Stonehenge like by the back door, because given that so many hundreds of thousands of people want to visit Stonehenge, they've had to move a visitor center about a mile to the east. So if you turn up, you know, conventionally, like in a car or on a bus, you you find yourself a mile away. You have to do all your checking in and buying your tickets there, and they put you on buses to take you down to Stonehenge. And to me, that's that's difficult to do as a pilgrim. It doesn't feel like a pilgrimage. But right. if you come in the other way, the way we believe that um, the, the the ancient pilgrims from pre-Christian times would have come, you come in through the back door, you go up from the river through another place called Woodhenge, um, which is a curious thing, was, as the name suggests, was built of wood, probably about the same time as Stonehenge. Um, and then you go in, there's a, there's a, a footpath across, across the moors, and you get to Stonehenge. I didn't meet anybody. There were just a few sheep out there. And you get there, and the and the kind of the guards are very surprised because you turn up the wrong way, and you say, "Hello, I'm a pilgrim. I've come this way." And they go, "Oh, okay, right." So they said, "Well, would you like a lift down? Because you've got to go and get a ticket." And they let me get on the bus. They took me down to get a ticket so I could come back and actually meet, um, wander around w- within the stones. But um, yeah, that's 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 a very very different experience. That's you make a really interesting point because. 
often we talk about pilgrimage in terms of, of Christian pilgrimage, and we know that, you know, first of all, there are people of all faiths that make pilgrimage, right? We, we yeah. talked about, I think, in our one of our previous um, shows, Pilgrimage to Mecca and, and the Muslim uh, tradition of pilgrimage. But pilgrimage, the, the act of walking um, in a thoughtful way, the act of walking in a faithful way, extends far beyond just, just Christian tradition. Yeah, and I always say, I think pilgrimage is for people of all faiths and none. You know, I I don't you know I don't think anyone wants to impose particular beliefs on pilgrims. I certainly don't. Um, but you do get something out of walking, and I just think it's a kind of essential human thing. I know not everyone likes walking, but plenty of us do. Um, and whatever our beliefs are, or indeed our lack of beliefs, walking can really really help us in in my experience. Well, especially after all we've been through with the 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 pandemic, um, I, I've learned more. Greek letters, Andy. Uh, unfortunately, I think I'm going to yeah. learn some more. Who knows? Yeah. Um, yeah. But it, it's really, in, in talking to people, it's made them be more reflective and be thinking about the connections that they want in their life, those that they want to prioritize. And and often, those are connections with, with faith, yeah. connections with spirituality, connections with a particular religious practice. Um, and, and for you and I, that happens to be Christianity, but for many, it's not this Stonehenge walk is a perfect example of people who were walking, um, because it was their tradition and because it was a thoughtful meditative practice The the Ave help me again, Avebury, Avebury, yeah, yep. Avebury, Avebury, um, the walk to Stonehenge is that that's a two day walk. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Unfortunately, about halfway, you halfway through it, you get to um, uh, a few villages on on the River Avon, and there are some nice pubs and places that you can stay there. Yeah, yeah, it's good. good. I mean, it all it also takes in um, uh, a really uh, prehistoric um, uh, route, kind of on the high the high downs route called the Ridgeway, which is probably the oldest road in England. So you get a real mix of history there. I love that. Um, one of the walks that I've been looking at, you know, um, because people are asking me where you're going to walk next. And, and I think, you know, if, if, if all my plans hold, which doesn't seem to be the case these days, but if they do, I hope to be walking, uh, the Via Francigena and, and finish in Rome very soon. Mm -hmm. And I was saying, if I can't go to Italy, I might uh, like to come back to the UK and do some walks. And so I was looking through Pilgrim Pathways, Andy's book from Trailblazer, and you have a, a route that is um, in the footsteps of some Celtic monks, the, the Cornish Saints Way. Yeah, that's that's another very interesting one. And again, a big contrast. So this goes from the, the north coast of Cornwall to the south. And for those who don't, as you say, not everyone knows the, the, the geography of England. But um, if you imagine um, a little, the, little, the little pointy bit that sticks out down in the southwest of, of England, that, that's Cornwall. Um, and it's pretty narrow. You know, it's about 18 miles across, direct or possibly less. So in the north, there's a, on the north coast, there's a, there's a town called Padstow. And on the south, there's a town called, I'm going to call it Foy. It's spelled F-O-W-E-Y. And a bit like you, Kevin, some people told me, no, it's Foy. But I think it's Foy, and I think locals call it Foy. So anyway, that's Between the, the two of us, we've got it covered. Because when I was looking oh. at it, I said, I said, this is Padstow to Foy. Um, yeah. and so yeah. you, you take that whole coast to coast walk, um, yeah. North, North from the North down to the South. Yeah. And the, the reason is that this, this route, I mean, it was a, again, in pre-Christian times, it was a droving route. Um, but, um, from about the fifth century, um, sort of hermits, monks, pilgrims, all sorts of people, some of whom wanted to go on to Compostela in Spain or indeed um, uh, Rome or Jerusalem, if they were, com they were coming from, um, from um, Wales and um, Ireland, and they didn't want to go around the, the, the coast of Cornwall because there's a bit called Land End at the, Land End at the very tip, which is treacherous, still treacherous now, but very treacherous 
you know, centuries ago. So they would go overland. They would go to Padstow and go overland. Um, and the really interesting thing is there are still um, former pilgrim hostelries. There's one at Padstow on the harbour. There's one about halfway, a place called St. Bennett's Abbey, which was a, was a medieval pilgrimage stop, but is still a B&B that you can go to. And there's another one um, down in Foy um, called um, Scallop Shell House. So you've got that kind of history there, you know, but, but not, all of, not all of the people who travelled that route were on, were on their way out. A lot of um, Celtic saints or Celtic holy men came and became saints, and they would sort of settle in little bits of Cornwall. And, and um, it was this was the time sort of the century, two centuries after the Romans had left. And apparently they were, the, 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 the locals were very susceptible to Christianity. You know, it, it kind of chimed well with them, and, um, and they had a lot of success. So there, was one, there were a whole bunch of them, but there was one called um, St. Petruk, who um, Padstow is named after. And he basically settled there, and his his monastery is where the where the the parish church is now. It's still there, and and there's a Celtic cross in the in the in the in the churchyard. And as you walk up, you walk up two rivers really. First off, you go up the the ca- the, the Camel Estuary, and then you go up to um, uh, a little place where Saint Petrarch also um, settled. And as you go across the, the country, you get all kinds of things. I mean, there are prehistoric sites, ancient Christian sites. Um, it's really, really a, a remarkable walk, including one little place at a village called Galant, where there is a Saint, Saint Samson, um, not quite spelt like the, uh, the guy with the hair and Delilah, <laughs> but um, there's a holy well there, right by the church is Samson's holy well. And there's a whole string of these fascinating little places. Well, and I was sort of intrigued because uh, you mentioned in Foey the, the scallop shell house, that obviously has some connection to Santiago. Absolutely. I mean, I think the present house is probably 18th century, something like that. But um, it is believed that it was built on the site of um, yeah, a, a pilgrim hostelry. And, um, you know, I, this is not something I'm, I'm a, an expert on by any means. But um, I believe in medieval times, um, a lot of, a lot of um, seafarers who were going to um, France and Spain would take pilgrims on the way out and bring back wine and all the other nice things that we all need to import. And they had to have, um, they had to have um, a license to carry pilgrims. All the, all the, all the ports were like this, mm-hmm. Southampton, Bristol, all the ports, and including, I, I guess, uh, Foy, where there would have been boats that would take people kind of hugging the coast along the south coast of England, hopping across the channel, and then following the, um, the French coast down to, to northern Spain. Uh, when you were on the podcast last, we talked about the the English Camino route, and obviously this route is not the English Camino route, the Cornish Saints Way, but this is a route if you um, are a traditional Camino pilgrim, where you can see this route of pilgrimage, they would get the boat and head to Spain to walk to Santiago de Compostela. So great history uh, and connection for those who may be interested in the Camino de Santiago as one more route to walk within the UK. Yeah, absolutely. And I think particularly as we were talking about, you know, lockdown, a lot of people started walking. Um, and one of the things, there was a lot of interest in, um, in, in pilgrimage in the UK simply because you could do it. But also we've, we're, we've got a, a sort of burgeoning interest in identifying the routes which were like feeder routes from which English British pilgrims would have gone across and then um, picked things up in Spain, going to Santiago. So there's a lot of, um, well, but yeah, there's quite a lot of research and a lot of um, a lot of interest. I'm particularly very interested in, in identifying those routes, and um, I know that the, the the church authorities in Spain are very very generously saying that um, a number of routes, when they're identified as um, having historic significance as feeder routes, they will actually allow you to start your pilgrimage on those routes and when you get to um, Spain you will have um, if you've done 25 kilometers in the UK that will count as 25 kilometers towards the 100 kilometers you need to get to to have your pilgrim um, passport stamped and to be officially um, a Camino pilgrim. Our guest today on the Sacred Steps podcast is English author Andy Bull. His book Pilgrim Pathways features 20 short walks in England 
Scotland, and Wales. We'll link it below in the show notes, but let me highly recommend that you pick up a copy. Um, Andy's book was such a, a an inspiration for me in learning so much about pilgrimage in the UK, because for many of us, um, and Andy, you talked about this uh, in, in our season one episode, the concept of English pilgrimage is lost to so many in the Western culture, but was also lost to so many within the UK because of the Reformation. Can you remind yeah. us a bit about the impact of the English Reformation on pilgrimage? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we going back a little bit to Henry VIII and the, and the 1530s, when Henry, having been considered a defender of the faith and a, and a great friend of the Pope, um, because of um, issues that we won't go too far into about um, needing divorces so that he could try and marry a woman who'd give him a male heir, um, split with Rome and declared himself the, the head of the church in England. And, and a number of things happened at the same time. He um, banned pilgrimage, banned the veneration of saints, and all the kind of things which were considered idolatrous. So you'll see, and if you ever go into English um, country churches, they are whitewashed. That's uh, because they painted out all the, all the, the they will have, will have been covered with um, paintings and murals of the Bible stories and so on. So for like 300 years or so, pilgrimage just didn't happen. So we lost our tradition. You know, in Spain, they didn't. You know, and that's why they've got such a powerful network of roots in Spain. But in England, we had, uh, and in Wales and in Scotland, we had a lot of local saints. So we've been sort of talking about some of the very big, important saints. But actually, there were a lot of little local saints. Um, people, you know, the, 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 the word holiday comes from holy day. And on holy days, people would go to a shrine of their local saint um, to make an offering and, and, and so on. So it's a, it's, I think it's a wonderful thing that we are, we are, you know, a lot of us are choosing to try and reclaim that, that tradition that, um, that got smashed. <laughs> Literally, um, it, it, there were shrines that were, that were destroyed and smashed. And, you know, as, as I was walking, I would talk to people, um, in, in particular, um, my longest walk was the London to Canterbury. So I would run into people along the North Downs way, um, in pubs and inns, uh, throughout the path. And many, many people were interested in walking pilgrimage. I think this is a great rebirth in the UK, uh, as you said, reclaiming the traditions, whether they were um, walking it to to visit a specific shrine. Um, you've outlined some some holy places that that are not, you know, um, uh, created by the by the church itself, but they were traditional local shrines, local saints. Um, I want to talk to you about a couple of saints over in Wales, and maybe we could talk about the uh, the Welsh lords, um, the burial place of saints, uh, Holy yeah. Well. Yeah, that's right. So there is there is another long distance route in um, North Wales, the North Wales Saints Way, and that goes from the coast on the River Dee, right on the, the North Wales coast, um, at an abbey called Bassingwork. And it, it's another long one. It goes 135 miles down to an island called Bardsey Island. Um, so what I did, you know, with my, my theme of trying to pick a, a kind of essential route you could do in two, possibly three days for this one, I did the bit from Bassingwork um, to um, a little village called Gwytherin. Now, the, there's there is a saint who connects them. She was called uh, Saint Winifred, um, and it's a it's a curious story. I mean, it's actually a very common story. When you start looking into these kind of Celtic or Anglo-Saxon saints, female saints, you find that they've got a lot in common. Their stories very often are that they were a princess, a prince wanted to marry them, they didn't worry wanted to marry him. He got angry, and in Winifred's case, her head was chopped off. Now, um, fortunately, her uncle, St. Bueno, stuck it back on, on again, and she survived. Um, but at the point where her head is supposed to have been chopped off, it's about three miles inland from Brassingwork at a place called Holywell. It's, look, it looks like Holywell. It's written Holywell. Again, I'm told locals call it Holywell. So I'm trying Holywell. to call it Holywell. Yeah. So where, where her, her head came to rest before it was stuck back on, a spring came up. And that spring's still there. And it's a, 
I say spring, we think of like a trickle out of the ground. This spring delivers 3,000 gallons of water every minute into this um, enormous wellhead. And then it spills over into a great big, it's like a swimming pool, but it's a kind of sacred pool. And pilgrims have been coming there for 1,300 years. And they're still coming now. And it managed to survive the Reformation. No one's quite sure why, as far as I'm aware, but there is a possibility that Henry VIII's mother actually um, funded the building of, of, of the, the medieval shrine there and a, and, a, and a chapel which is built above it. So it may be that it had some kind of you know, royal protection. In any case, when I, when I went there, I, there were pilgrims who were following the old tradition of you get, you get into the pool fully clothed, you walk around it three times, and then you kiss a cross cut on the side of it. There was a big Irish family there when I was there, and it, it was very interesting to see. The grandparents went in, the parents, the children, even the babies had their, their heads dipped. Um, and I, you know, I just thought that's a, a remarkable tradition that, that's still going. Um, but the reason for mentioning um, that particularly and um, uh, um, St. Winifred is that in her later life, St. Winifred retired and had a monastery at this place, Gwytherin, um, which is a further, further to the west. And she built it. Um, yeah, so you mentioned the Welsh Lords. So the, yeah. the Holy Well is like the Welsh Lords. And the other place we mentioned is like the, the Welsh burial place, place of saints. So at Gwytherin, this is... Um, an ancient burial site. There's a mound that's never been excavated, but the tradition is that um, all kinds of saints, um, kings and Welsh kings and queens are buried there, including a cousin of St. David, the patron saint of Wales. So um, uh, Winifred went there with her nuns and had a, had a monastery, um, but um, it, and it attracted so many pilgrims that, you know, I don't know if you're aware of this, but Every every um, monastery every uh, want, wanted wanted the remains of a saint because it would attract pilgrims. So um, some saints at um, Shrewsbury um, got very jealous. Um, so they came and they took Winifred's remains and they took them and they're still at Shrewsbury Cathedral, which meant that if you wanted to venerate Saint Winifred, there was no point going to Gwytherin because she's not there anymore. You had mm. to go. You had to go to Shrewsbury. So. But when you get there, it's a tiny place. It's like a hamlet of about half a dozen houses. But there's also um, a former chapel. It's only um, Victorian, and it's deconsecrated. But a wonderful lady called Alison Goldborn came to it, saw it derelict, and decided to restore it. And she's done it. And you go in, and there's this beautiful chapel beside this mound, this ancient burial place. Um, and she runs it as a sort of a civil wedding center. But she's also hoping when well, I was, I saw, I saw her before lockdown, and things have got very tight. Wales was particularly yeah. tightly locked down. But um, she, I know she has an ambition to invite pilgrims um, for um, uh, champing, which I don't know if you know that word, champing. Uh, no, tell is, us a little bit about that okay. because that's something we don't hear about right. in the in the U.S. Okay, well, so we all started off with camping. We, we knew that that was. Then there was something called glamping, which was like posh camping. So you might be in a yurt with a, you know, a, a stove. Um, champing is the idea that you will camp in a church. Um, and it's being introduced particularly in, in disused churches, churches where, you know, they've no longer got a congregation. Some of them are deconsecrated. Others just don't have services. And there's an, an idea that one of the things that can be done with them is to invite walkers, and pilgrims um, to stay there. And Alison is very generously trying to do that at Witherin, this amazing historic site. So, you know, I, I think that's a fantastic thing. I also yeah. ought to mention, Kevin, just one other little highlight along the way. There's a place called St. Asaf, which is only a village, but it's a city. It's the smallest city in the UK. And the reason it's so important is it has a cathedral there, um, and it's the place where the Bible was first translated into Welsh. Oh wow! Yeah. So a great historic site for for Wales um, and the Welsh people. Absolutely, and I, I would love I would love to do the whole 135 miles down to Barnsley Island, and maybe I'll be able to get back there. But if you if you think if anyone is inspired by that and wants something that they can do in a weekend, that I'd, I'd recommend. If not from um, Bassingwork, start from Hollywell. Hollywell to Gwytherin is a fantastic doable walk, and um, and, and has got some amazing history. So this Hollywell to Gwytherin is outlined in Pilgrim Pathways. If you're interested in doing the the longer um, Saints Walk, you can find it on the British Pilgrimage Trust website as well. 
um, we were speaking with Dr. Guy Hayward, and he was he was actually speaking about this walk as well. So I'm glad to know there's a way in which I could experience it in a shorter walk rather than making you know a 10 plus day walk. I'm not that familiar with the countryside in Wales. What should we be expecting in this walk? Is it um, uh, what is the terrain and uh, and such through Wales? It, this part is hilly. If you went further past Gritherin, you get into Snowdonia, so it becomes mountainous um, and spectacular, but challenging, I believe. I haven't walked that bit, but I believe that's much more challenging. But the, the bit that I'm talking about, it's, um, it's, it's rolling hills. It's nothing, mm-hmm. it's nothing too, um, too strenuous. Great. Well, that's right up my alley. I, after uh, having done some of the, what did we call it there? The, the South Southern eastern southeastern england yeah (laughs) north i guess you're you're on the north downs which is like chalk downland yeah that was that was great i I love that part i also loved being up in in northern england along the scottish border regions and as someone who hasn't gotten out into the english countryside i have to just tell you how breathtaking the english countryside is i can't wait to be walking in wales one day as well and to really get over into the Cornish side. But as an American, we tend to come to just the, the tourist attractions. We go to, you know, we, we go to the cities that, um, have the greatest lift and and with London being one of them, but here's a great way to experience the UK as an add on to a vacation. So go to London, do the theater, do the museums, um, see the the royal exhibits but then take two days and and get into the english countryside there's great transit to these areas as well we were talking uh at the beginning of the podcast about the northern saints way you can simply take the train straight up um to barrack and and start that walk um you know you are you have great connectivity throughout england scotland and wales to make these walks yeah, and I also think, Kevin, particularly like if you're from America or a large country and you look at England, you think, oh, it's only 400 miles. I could drive that in, you know, eight hours or something. And you could, but um, you won't see much because <laughs> our motorways, like most motorways, just whiz you through. And actually, England suits um, walking um, and cycling as well. But at walking pace, you get to see it properly. If you try and do it any faster, you, you'll just miss stuff. Yeah. Andy, in the brief time we have left, I know you've got some walks uh, that you want to do this year. Um, I, when we were together in London, you were talking about uh, working on some walks for um, Walsingham. How's that project coming? Yeah, so this is this is something which came out of the last book, Kevin, because um, I was looking at Walsingham, um, and I think everyone. The traditional belief is that Canterbury is our most um, was and is our most important shrine. But when I looked into it, I discovered that it wasn't that Walsingham, which is just a village in Norfolk, was actually much more important, particularly in the last few decades before um, Henry um, abolished pilgrimage. And there's a very curious story there. So this village in um, in the 11th century, there was um, a local um, noblewoman called Ricaldis who, in a dream or a vision, was taken by the Virgin Mary to Nazareth and shown the holy house, the, the house of the Annunciation, you know, where she was told yeah. that she would give birth to Jesus. Um, and she was told, make a replica in Walsingham. So she did. Now, initially, it was a fairly simple wooden structure. But over the centuries, it got more and more ornate. A whole string of kings went there, including Henry multiple times. Catherine of Aragon regularly went there. Um, Henry and Catherine and would pray, go there to pray for a son. Um, it, and it became incredibly rich, incredibly wealthy, and by far the most important shrine in England. But yeah, I was, was, I was fascinated in our conversation because, you know, I, I, and I think before you and I had talked a little bit about Walsingham cause I just read about it. And actually, um, one of the places I had, had read was, was in a book called Britain's Pilgrim Places from the the British Pilgrimage Trust, which is a great book, great gift uh, for anyone who's considering walking Mm. in the UK. It's got great stories in there as well. But you had said, um, and and maybe we should sit down and talk in more detail about Walsingham at at some point in the future, but you had said, this is a place that as a pilgrimage shrine 
was one of the most visited in all the world. It was. It was the fourth most important after Santiago, Rome, and Jerusalem. Um, and it was phenomenally important. But the weird thing was, it wasn't a city like Canterbury. It didn't have Chaucer, so it mm -hmm. got forgotten. So the, the road from London, most pilgrims went from London. The road from London, 180 miles, was the most important road in, um, in, in medieval England. But when, when, when pilgrims couldn't go to Walsingham anymore, it died out. So, mm -hmm. you know, when you look on maps, you, you'll see pilgrim routes very often on, on a map, on a modern map. Nothing. I thought, why is there nothing on the map? for Walsingham. And, and when I found that there wasn't, that it had almost completely died out, other than a few church groups, and people, a lot of people go, but they get in a coach or their car, and they just, they walk the last mile, the last holy mile. I thought, let's try and reestablish the route. Let's try and get it, you know, get a guidebook out, um, get it waymarked, get it recognized. Um, and so I've been working with the Confraternity of St. James to do that. I had some wonderful volunteers through lockdown who took the route. I did a lot of historic research and there was a guy who, who had actually done all the, all the historic research mm. um, in, you know, 50, 60 years ago, but he never actually walked it or applied it to a modern map. So I put it on a map. We walked it. We worked out the best routes, the, the best paths, and again, tried to make sure people have got trains in and out for each stage and so on to make it as simple as possible. But these days in Walsingham, from the 1930s, you've got an Anglican shrine, which is right by where the Holy House was, very close to it, a Catholic shrine, and a place called the Slipper Chapel, which is a mile out where traditionally pilgrims took their shoes and socks off and, and, and off and on there, either walked barefoot or crawled on their hands and knees there. And then you've got um, Walsingham Abbey, which is a, now a, a, a beautiful um, uh, country house. But in the, in the grounds are the ruins of the um, Walsingham Priory and the point where the, um, the Holy House was. And you mentioned, you know, Henry having everything smashed. This place was so historic, so profoundly important, that not a trace could be left. There's nothing there, absolutely nothing. They stripped it out, just like they did at Canterbury. Mm. At Canterbury, they've just got a single candle burning where, um, where the shrine was. At Walsingham, um, where the Holy House was, there's just a little, a little, a little A-board saying, this was this was where it was, but it's an um, amazing place, an amazing amazing holy village. That's fascinating. You're going to have to come back uh, on the podcast, Andy, and I want to talk about a pilgrimage route to Walsingham because, to me, that sounds like a very traditional British pilgrimage that everyone needs to learn more about. I'd love to do that, Kevin, and um, I'm planning to walk it again with some um, friends and pilgrims during the next year. So if you're around at all and you'd like to walk some of it with me, you'd be very welcome. That sounds like a great invitation. I can't wait, and it would be good to see you again, my friend. Uh, yeah, and in the meantime, I hope uh, that you'll continue to be well and, and stay safe uh, in the UK. You too, Kevin. Yeah, we're keeping all our fingers crossed. Exactly. Andy, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's great to learn more about these routes. Andy's book is Pilgrim Pathways from Trailblazer. We'll link it below in the show notes. We'll also outline because his book contains uh, some beautiful photos of the routes, GPS as well that are all outlined in there, and easy transportation links if you want to take these one and two day walks in England, Scotland, and Wales. Andy, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Buen Camino, my friend. You too, Kevin. You too. This has been the Sacred Steps Podcast. Visit sacredstepspodcast.com for episode notes, links, or to contact Kevin. Watch us online on YouTube. We read every comment. Please add your review and feedback. Before you go, tap subscribe to have episodes added to your playlist. Until next time, buen camino.